Hello, I'd like to welcome you to the Naval War College and today's presentation on the legal implications of autonomous weapon systems. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Jeff Thurner. I'm a faculty member here in the International Law Department and I'm happy to uh, have the opportunity to talk to you today about uh, these unique weapon systems. One, one disclaimer before I begin is I, I want to make it clear that today's remarks that these are my personal uh, opinions and uh, on, on these particular issues and they should not be inferred at, so as to reflect necessarily the views of the Department of Defense, the Naval War College, or any other government entity. Okay, this area I'm very excited to talk to you today because it's an area of research that uh, our department, the International Law Department here at the War College, and I personally have been uh, examining closely for many months now. The, uh, and, it's, and it's a very um, interesting issue uh, dealing with unique weapons that has caused a little bit of controversy, which we'll talk about today. Uh, I have recently, in fact, published an article about on this subject with my department chairman, Professor Michael Schmidt, and uh, it's just been released in the Harvard National Security Journal, and today's talk is going to draw heavily on that work, uh, but it's just a, today will just be an overview. It's really just a primer on the issue, so if you're looking for something more in depth, I, I would encourage you to look uh, at that article. Okay, what is it that we're talking about today? You see the, the title is The Legal Implications of Autonomous Weapon System. What, what sort of systems are we really talking about, and when Often when I uh, talk to people about autonomous weapon systems, they mention that, um, that they think the first thing that comes to their mind is drones. They think we're talking about drones. And in fact, if you look at this next slide, you'll see that uh, you'll see a definition. I wanted to start just with a quick initial definition to make sure that we're on the same footing. We're, we're not talking about systems like drones, where you have a pilot that's guiding it throughout uh, its mission, where uh, and a uh, human operator is actually pushing the trigger in order to gauge uh, a lethal or to initiate a lethal strike. Okay, with autonomous weapon systems, you have systems that are able to select and engage targets without that human operator, uh, that, without that human interface. Uh, and um, so you're looking at kind of the next generation of weapons. And I, I just want to make sure that we're all clear. So, some of you might think, wow, that sounds like science fiction. That, that sounds like something that may be hundreds of years off. You know, why, why are we even talking about it? Why is, why is it important? Why should you care about this topic today? And there's a couple reasons why I think it's important for, for, for all of us to examine it. The first is that this technology um, is starting to appear in weapon systems now. Uh, and frankly, some of it is, has been in weapon systems for many years that we're going to talk about here shortly. Uh, and many experts predict that you may start to see, or we, we will start to see autonomous weapon systems becoming the norm on the battlefield within the next 20 years. So we really are talking about something that may be happening much sooner than, than you may have predicted. Um, the second reason, though, is that these systems, as I mentioned, have generated a lot of controversy. There is some uh, opposition to the development and the deployment of these systems. And so I want us to be aware of that. One of the things you can see here is that the, there was a report published by a group, Human Rights Watch, an influential NGO, last or in November of 2012 that uh, in fact called for a preemptive ban on the development and the use of autonomous weapon systems. So I thought it's important for you here in the audience today to understand, to be conversant, fully conversant in these issues and to understand that this ongoing debate is occurring. Okay, you can take a look here at our agenda. This uh, will show you the main points I'm hoping to cover today. We are going to start with some definitions because uh, I think that, as you'll see, autonomy is uh, it's difficult. It's kind of tricky to nail down specifically what we're talking about, so we'll talk about some of those issues. We'll also look at what the current U.S. policy is about these systems, and we'll further examine why, why it is that autonomy offers some promise, well, you know, why it might be good if, in fact, the technology can deliver. And then we are going to examine that technology and see where we are, where the current state is, and, and where it may be heading in the future. And lastly, and primarily, uh, the topic for today will be a focus on the law and the legal issues dealing with these systems. Okay, I showed you initially a, a definition. I, I really, when you're, when you're looking at autonomous systems, you can see here there's generally three different categories of autonomous uh, weapons or autonomous systems. And want to try and walk you through these different systems. You can see we start with semi-autonomous systems, then you have human supervised autonomous systems, and then the fully autonomous systems. Uh, it can be pretty hard to define uh, what 
sort of system would fit into each of these categories. Uh, and it, there's a lot of controversy. It's a, kind of a big technical debate about what constitutes maybe automatic systems or uh, autonomous and, and how much autonomy system needs to have to qualify for these things. But we're going to take a look at it. In fact, one of the things I'm uh, involved in right now is a multinational project examining autonomous weapon systems. And we're spending actually the first several months just looking at definitions, just trying to make sure that we frame the problem correctly and that we are addressing these issues. But the crux of autonomy, of full autonomy, is really, I think, that ability to identify and target and attack uh, either a military person or objective without that human interface. Uh, that said, I think that this term, I, I put, uh, as you saw, saw on the slide, you, I put in uh, parentheses kind of some more common, commonly used terms about humans in the loop or out of the loop. I really think that human out of the loop is a complete misnomer. Uh, I do not think that there are systems where a human is not involved. I mean, if you think about it, a human certainly will be involved from the design, the decision to employ, the parameters that will be established for the system, the guidance and direction that will be given. So I, I think it is, uh, is significantly a misnomer, uh, and, I, and, and that's why we'll use primarily the other terms. Uh, but okay, let's take a closer look at those actual definitions and see see some examples of them. Okay, if you look at the first one, here you see a semi-autonomous weapons systems, uh, and you can see the example of fire and forget missiles. Here, these are the type of systems, uh, semi-autonomous systems that are very uh, commonplace, frankly, in today's contemporary warfare. Uh, fire and forget or launch and leave uh, weapons like these sort of missiles. Uh, are in many nations' arsenals. And uh, when you take a look at it, the autonomous section, how, how it fits in with human control, the human is identifying the target, locks in on target, and then sends the missile that direction. And then the missile, or whatever other sort of weapon system, uh, directs itself autonomously, ultimately, to the target and engages the target without further human involvement uh, once the thing has been fired. So those sort of systems are considered semi-autonomous. Uh, and and uh, like I said, are in existence in, in many nations right now. Okay, let's take a look at human supervised autonomous systems. So now we're looking at a little bit of a step up. Uh, these systems also have been used by militaries in the U.S. and other militaries for many years. Uh, the U.S. in fact has, uh, as you can see here, has the Aegis that they use, the Aegis weapon system out at sea, and also the Patriot missile system, which is used on land. Both are designed to defend against short notice missile attacks. So a missile is coming, these systems are able to identify that threat and would be able to automatically engage it. The difference, though, the reason that they're not fully autonomous and they're not uh, without human involvement is that these systems have a, um, have a human operator who's observing the system and then is ultimately approving, uh, approving that strike. Just last year uh, in uh, the Middle East, um, Israel had a lot of success with its Iron Dome system, it would also be considered human supervised autonomous system because it had somebody sitting over top of the system ready to essentially veto a strike uh, if, if so necessary. So, but these are very short, there's very short time period that is able to respond and, um, or that the human would have to respond. And so most of the work is essentially being done by the system to identify, uh, but it does have human override capabilities. Okay, next we're going to look at the fully autonomous weapon systems. And I once again threw up the definition that the DOD has issued in, in, in its current policy directive dealing with autonomous weapon systems that, that we will talk about here uh, in a little greater detail. But you can see that definition. So it's talking about weapon systems that are, once they're activated, they are capable of selecting and engaging targets without any further human interface or human operator involvement being necessary. Now you don't see any cool pictures on this slide. Uh, and that's in part because fully autonomous systems are not yet known to exist in any nation's arsenals. And in fact, the U.S. Is, is on record now of saying that they are not planning to develop any lethal autonomous weapon systems other than perhaps some of the human supervised autonomous weapon systems that we had just looked at previously. Um, that said, so you have those three categories. I'll tell you that there is a little, uh, I, I told you that some of these definitions were difficult to determine. Well, there's other sort of systems that it's hard to envision how they fit into things or it's not clear how they fit into things. And if you look at the next slide here, we show the uh, several different systems that are currently in existence uh, that have been used for many years. First is naval mines. You have 
uh, sea mines that are able to, some, t some of them able to maneuver and certainly able to wait to engage until they pick up a specific acoustic or seismic uh, signal. So they're, they're, they're waiting for that particular signal when they identify it, then they're able to respond by initiating the mine and, 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 and engaging the target. Uh, the, we'll talk about the DOD directive, but interestingly they said that, the naval, that mines are not part of the directive, so they don't fall under the autonomous system. But many people would argue, well, well those certainly seem to be autonomous systems of some sort. Uh, other systems are uh, considered or are often are called automatic weapon defense systems. As I mentioned to you, there's, there's a debate about well, what is automatic versus what is autonomous and where do you draw the line between. Generally, people think, well, autonomous means there's more uncertainty and the system has to be able to operate within that, the operate under parameters where, the, where things are uncertain, where an automatic system has a little more fixed uh, situations, more deterministic of a system. But de determining where that dividing line is, it can be complicated. Well, I'll tell you that close-in weapon systems, like you saw here, already exist on ships throughout the US and in many other nations. Those are, they're designed to be point defense systems, kind of a last resort defense measure for ships. Uh, these, if you are trying to distinguish them from other sort of perhaps autonomous systems, or fully autonomous systems, you argue that these systems are all defensive in nature and that these systems are all fixed, either at a base or on, on ships. And so that would be some sort of distinguishing factor. The other one I've thrown on the slide that you saw is Stuxnet, okay? Interestingly, uh, many researchers are starting to talk about whether Stuxnet was in itself the first, maybe the first fully autonomous cyber system that was used, cyber weapon system that was used in combat. If you can believe what you read in the, or if, if it's true that what, what's available in the open source press about Stuxnet and how it operated, apparently it seems to have been a computer virus that was designed to enter into a closed system and then to search out, so it's closed system, so it's not able to reach back to a human operator. It was, once it was inserted into the system, it was on its own and it searched through those computer networks to find the particular uh, target and then it was to respond and attack that particular target on its own. Uh, so one could certainly argue that maybe that's an autonomous system that, it, that has been used already uh, in the world. And so, you know, we could have a whole discussion on, on just the Stuxnet and whether that is. Uh, I'm just trying to raise the point that it's not always clear. Okay, where, where did it have the dividing line? It's not always clear. And so uh, even though you have maybe categories that people have established or think they have it established, uh, that it, it's hard to determine some of these things on the edges. Uh, okay, next I wanted to take a look at what the DOD policy is. Now I told you, in fact, that the policy didn't address mines. It also doesn't address cyber weapons. So basically says those sort of systems are not falling under the policy. But what the policy is ensuring is it's ensuring that for future development of weapon systems that they will all have the appropriate level of human involvement on targeting decisions. So that they want to make sure that there's a human that is involved uh, at some aspect of the targeting process. Uh, and it created some guidelines. It really set what the policy was. It set um, the plans for using proper safety mechanisms, having other things to try and ensure that any weapon systems don't have unintended consequences or unintended engagements. Uh, you know, it's rec showing recognition, I guess, that the U.S. is concerned and is aware that there could be, with these unique weapon systems, there could be some pitfalls. Uh, and so they're trying to work hard to ensure that systems don't have any of those sort of, uh, that they don't run into any sort of errors like that. Um, so while it's clear when this policy came out, the U.S. made it clear that they were not going to be pursuing fully autonomous weapon systems. Uh, they were only going to use the human supervised system, so somebody, an, an operator would be sitting over the top able to veto any system, uh, and that those systems primarily be used defensively. Uh, the policy, though, it, it certainly some critics have said, well, that's just a policy and, and doesn't mean that the policy can't be changed. And so it's important to look at why, why if the U.S. is making policy, why are some concerned that maybe the policy change? What is so good about autonomous systems and why might they be pursued? Okay, so let's take a look at what makes them so desirable. I think there's a few things that, that do, uh, do make them very enticing for countries to develop and, and potentially to use, again, if the technology is able to produce a, as is advertised. 
Okay, when you take a look at it, there's several operational realities, uh, several ep operational concerns that would lend a, a would, would make perhaps an autonomous system a superior system over other systems. A uh, few things. When you have, as we do with drones or other remotely piloted systems, you have a team of folks that are having to observe each and every, uh, every weapon system. Uh, and that can be very intensive personnel-wise. Okay? It can be costly uh, to try and maintain all of that. Where a, an autonomous system, generally, the, the rule would be the more autonomous the system is, the fewer people that you need to uh, be observing it. So that's certainly one advantage. The other advantage, uh, another operational advantage, is that is about the tethers to the systems. If you look at how all of our remotely piloted systems are connecting between the human operator and the weapon system itself, there is some sort of connection, a communication link that ensures that the human pilot or controller is able to maneuver the system. Well, so you have a link. And there are vulnerabilities anytime you have a link like that, uh, particularly when we're dealing in environments now where um, people's abilities to jam communications or to satellite communications or, or they're able to attack cyber attacks perhaps on uh, satellites and things like that would make, uh, make any time that w makes that connection between the two a critical vulnerability. And so if that link is taken out now, most of the systems will either return back to base so they won't be able to complete their mission or, or perhaps worse, that they, that they would, they would land, have to land or crash land. Uh, and so if you have systems that, if any sort of link was cut, are still able to conduct their mission, well, that would certainly be a significant advantage over what we currently have. And I think those are, that's one of the operational concerns that may in the future uh, push people towards looking for systems that can keep engaging even in the absence of, of that communications link back to, back to, a, excuse me, back to a human operator. Okay, I also think that as the technology develops, uh, you're going to start to see other nations pursuing these systems and being interested in the systems. And uh, certainly, one side doesn't want to be at a disadvantage against the other. And the reason may be that it would be a disadvantage is that if you have uh, one side that has an autonomous system, generally the autonomous system, the presumption is that it will be able to react faster. It'll be able to do things faster than a system that's either human, humanly controlled or uh, certainly one that is remotely controlled. Uh, so that the autonomous system is already making a decision while the human is trying to figure out how to adjust things with, with the, either their main system or, or, or their remotely controlled system. And so if you're always a little bit behind, uh, the pilots often refer to it as the OODA loop. So you're, you're getting within their decision cycle. If you are already within the decision cycle, then potentially the side that doesn't have the autonomous system uh, would always be behind it and would be losing out to the system, to the force that does have the autonomous system. So I think as the pace, the tempo of combat in the future continues to speed up, you're going to see more of a need, more of an increase, uh, desire to have systems that are able to react faster and to be able to react on their own. Um, ultimately, the concern is that at some point, maybe the environment will be too complex, be too fast for a human to actually direct it effectively. Okay, so we, all this talk about why autonomy might be desirable, it's important to then look at, well, what is the state of this technology? Where are we really uh, in terms of having potential breakthroughs? You know, what, what is it that's causing people to even discuss these autonomous systems or having uh, groups being opposed to them? So we'll take a look at the state of the technology itself. First thing I want to look at is just a few examples from the civilian world. There, there are a couple things that have been very prominent in the news and the media uh, that highlight some of the advantages and, and some of the advancements that we've seen in autonomous research uh, and some development. Okay, if you take a look at this slide, you'll see that the top shows, uh, hopefully maybe you'll recognize that it's a scene from the TV show Jeopardy, where uh, last year the, a team from IBM put together a computer system called Watson that was able to not only compete against but beat some of the best human players in the, in the game show of Jeopardy. It used a, a series of uh, a real novel approach to algorithms uh, and linking computers together to try and cipher through the complex language that is used on that show and reach uh, an answer faster and better than the human uh, contestants were able to do. 
uh, and certainly shows some of the promise that if a system is able uh, to do that, is, is able to figure out those sort of things, um, that potentially they could be used in other aspects. In one place we've started to see some further developments in the autonomous field is with the driverless car that Google has been developing and, and others are certainly developing right now as well. Uh, a lot of those are relying uh, on this idea of machine learning, that a system is able to, over time, improve its own capabilities uh, and is able to learn, if you will. Uh, it's something that machine learning really is a term, a kind of a, uh, an equivalent to artificial intelligence. I think now machine learning, I think maybe is, is the primary phrase that's used more so than even uh, artificial intelligence. But the idea that systems are able, over, over time, using these uh, novel approaches, they're able to um, improve their capabilities steadily and uh, then able to operate further removed from human operators and with less requirement for a human interface. Now, let's take a look at how DOD has approached uh, these changes to autonomy. I, I would tell you that uh, the U.S. has certainly been aware of this and has been involved. In fact, the, the Google Car project kind of stemmed from an earlier project by the Department of Defense Research, uh, the DARPA uh, group. And so the U.S. is already embedding a lot of autonomous features into its weapon systems or into its um, vehicles and, and other systems that are, that are in existence now. If you take a look at a couple here that I've shown, uh, the first is the K-MAX helicopter, which the Marines have been using, in fact, in Afghanistan. So you have a couple, they have two helicopters that have flown more than 1,000 missions and have delivered more than 3 million pounds of cargo between forward operating bases flying autonomously. So they're able to pick up uh, a cargo load and fly it without having a human operator steering it the whole way uh, to, drop it, to drop it off. Um, it's been a very successful project so far. Down below that you see the uh, X-47B. It's an experimental aircraft that the Navy is developing and the intent, the, the Navy's intention is that they want to have a vehicle that can or they want to perfect the ability for systems to autonomous, autonomously land and take off from an aircraft carrier. And you see two pictures of it, uh, one just the vehicle by itself, and the second is the vehicle, in fact, taking off from an aircraft carrier successfully just in, in May of earlier this month, actually, uh, in May of, t of 2013, uh, where it was able to take off, and the plans are for it to, it's already done some touch and go landings, and the plan is for later on this year for it to able to also autonomously land really complex maneuvering. Uh, you know, any pilot can tell you how difficult it is to, to land and deal with all the variables of, of trying to take off and land from an aircraft carrier. And it appears as though uh, the, some of the autonomous technology is going to allow uh, these systems to do that. Now, those are certainly not weapon systems. Okay, Those are, those are non-weaponized uh, uses. Uh, but it's showing you some of the progress and some of the development in the autonomous field and, and in that technological and, and in the research that's going on right now. When you look at some of the near-term things, so just in a few years in the future, some of the things that are being developed, I have a couple examples for you here. First is an aircraft that the uh, British military is developing. It's called um, Tyrannus, and it's a supersonic aircraft. So it's a, a stealth aircraft. Uh, it's able to fly at high speeds. It's able to fly autonomously, and it's designed ultimately to be an attack aircraft, uh, but they are not at this point in putting any sort of um, autonomous targeting features into the system, but you could certainly see that maybe in the future that would be something that they perhaps would be interested in, in, in changing. But the aircraft would be designed uh, to fly without human pilot, you know, without a human controller uh, in order to get to an area, and then I guess it's envisioned that it, the human controller would then approve the particular strike. Uh, another system that uh, the U.S. is looking at developing right now uh, is an anti-submarine system called the ACTIV, and when you, it stands for the Anti-Submarine Warfare Continuous Trail Unmanned Vehicle, long name. Uh, but those systems are being designed to go out to sea for up to 90 days and to autonomously maneuver and track enemy submarines. So it can find the enemy submarine and it can trail it uh, over the seas all by itself without a human operator or human uh, interface. Uh, at this point, it's not being designed to attack that enemy submarine, uh, but as I mentioned, th those would be things that perhaps in the future uh, nations may want to um, look for 
taking the next step based upon what, what these systems have, have already demonstrated, I guess, or what they may be able to demonstrate. Now, when you look to the further out future, I guess, if you're looking for what sort of systems to expect in the future, I mean, it's pretty difficult to, to, um, to determine. You know, I, I certainly can't predict where the future uh, will lead and how some of this technology may be developed and how successful it may uh, prove to be. Uh, but what I do anticipate, one of the things I think is pretty easy to say, is when you look at systems in the future, what are you going to see? I think you're going to see computer systems that are far faster and more capable uh, than anything that we have today. I mean, I think that's a pretty easy understanding that computer systems have been uh, continually improving uh, for many, for consistently, and so th the idea is that they would continue to, but they're also getting smaller and smaller, and so you're able to do more things, have more powerful systems that are in smaller packages. Uh, and I think you're going to start to see them used in some unique ways. Uh, some swarming technology, the idea that systems will collaboratively work together to go and attack a target where they you won't have a human operator leading each of the small little, um, small little attacking systems. You'll have the system itself deciding how to how to shape and, and, and move in order to appropriately and effectively take out an enemy. Uh, I think there's a lot of promise with some of the re initial research that's been done in swarming systems. Uh, and I think you're going to see a, a greater use of the machine learning capabilities. I think you're going to start to see perhaps some moves into more what is the called the general artificial artificial intelligence or strong artificial intelligence. Uh, these notions that systems aren't just making simple choices, uh, you know, between you know, in a specific defined task, that they actually are able to make more complex decision making, have more complex decision making abilities, more akin to you know human like cognitive abilities. Not saying that they necessarily will get there. There's been lots of promises over the years about oh, artificial intelligence will reach some sort of point of singularity or whatever, and uh, many of those predictions have, have not borne out. But I do think you're going to start to see so, some increases in these sort of systems. Uh, and so in general, I think that you should not expect the systems of the future to necessarily look like they do, like the systems do today. So you shouldn't just be a better predator drone. I, I think that you could see radically different shapes, uh, size, uh, and abilities. But uh, when, you're, when we're looking for how things are going to develop in the future, I do think that they're going to be subtle and incremental. I don't think we're just going to wake up and have, wow, we now have a fully autonomous system capable of attacking an enemy. I think this is something that slowly over time we're going to start to see a widening and a separation, further separation of the human op the ability to separate further the human operator from the system itself. Uh, and, and so I do think it'll be a, a more of a gradual process uh, than something that just uh, happens overnight. OK, so we have all this promise with weapon systems. And it, as I mentioned, has led to some pretty intense opposition. Uh, groups are forming. I, I mentioned Human Rights Watch in their report. Uh, they've been very vocal in their opposition to these systems. They've, in fact, called for a preemptive ban uh, for all development and research of these sort of systems, and certainly for, de for any sort of deployment or use of the systems. Uh, they've joined a coalition that's called the uh, Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. Uh, which is lobbying governments and citizens around the world uh, for, for a similar ban. Um, and even recently, uh, last month in April of 2013, a UN special rapporteur uh, issued a report for the UN Human Rights Council where he recommended a moratorium on all autonomous weapon system research pending uh, some sort of a gathering of nations to lay out a framework and uh, kind of a legal and a, and, a, and a political framework for how to deal with them. Uh, so the, a lot of opposition, and they have many grounds for opposing these systems. Okay? They have ethical, moral, certainly policy arguments, but uh, they, they do have some legal arguments, and that's where I want to focus our attention today, because I want to uh, zero us in on what those legal concerns are and try and address how um, kind of walk through what the law is in particular. You know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, so I'm, I feel most qualified in dealing with the legal issues. Uh, I, I'd leave it for somebody else to address more of the ethical or, or more arguments with them. But OK, so let's take a look at the law. And so it's important to understand and take a look at whether and how uh, autonomous weapon systems could be in compliance with the law. Okay, rather than going in some sort of count, pointer, count, uh, debate, point, counterpoint, debate with 
the, the critics about you know the these systems. I want to really just lay out the foundational uh, the foundational rules that apply for new weapon systems and how they might apply to autonomous weapon systems, and we'll explore uh, what unique issues these systems raise. Okay, so what law applies? That's obviously where you'd want to start. Right? You need to know what law is applicable for autonomous weapon systems. And I think it is there is universal uh, consensus that the law of armed conflict does in fact apply to new weapon systems like autonomous weapon systems. Uh, what's contentious though is how the particular norms of the law of armed conflict would apply to new systems. So, I mean that's the same debate that's occurring with drones now or with cyber weapons or cyber warfare. Uh, same thing would apply for autonomous weapon systems. Um, I think the ICRC and other groups are, are, have said that there's no doubt that this body of law does apply to new weaponry uh, and to its employment. Okay, so if we're looking at how uh, a new weapon system, how, how do we know if a weapon system is lawful and could be lawfully used on the battlefield, I tell you there's two tracks that you have to look at, two different aspects of the law that a weapon system must successfully navigate, okay, that it must comply with both parts in order for the weapon system to be lawfully developed and lawfully used on the battlefield. First is, a, is weapons law. So you're basically looking at whether the weapon itself is unlawful per se. So is the weapon of a nature uh, that it should not be developed at all? Uh, if that's not the case, then the second part you're going to look at is targeting law. Okay, you're looking at how the, the conduct of hostilities or how the weapon system is to be used in the battlefield uh, or, or on the battlefield, and, and we'll take a look at it. So two, di two different systems. I want to give just kind of an illustration. If you look at the first, okay, uh, the weapons law, unlawful per se, what sort of systems are we talking about? Well, here you'd be talking about, for example, something like a biological weapon. Okay, biological weapons, uh, customarily, they are uh, unlawful per se. So even if you were using them against an attacking enemy, okay, the use of biological weapons uh, or having a, trying to use and develop biological weapons would be inappropriate because that weapon system itself is unlawful per se. Okay, but the second is targeting laws when you're looking at how do you use a system. And that, the system, uh, you know, you can have a system that is lawful itself, like say a rifle, but it could be used in a way that would be unlawful. Like you could take a rifle and you could shoot, you know, if you were to shoot a civilian or shoot a prisoner, well that would certainly be an unlawful use of it. So those are kind of the two tracks we're going we're gonna to walk through. So let's take a look at weapons law first. When you look at weapons law, so when you're looking at whether the weapon system itself is unlawful per se, there's two separate rules that you have to look at. The first rule is uh, dealing with weapons that are indiscriminate by nature. Okay, so a weapon that is indiscriminate by nature is unlawful per se and should not be developed. It cannot cannot be uh, part of a of a nation's arsenal. Okay, and the the rule comes from uh, it's codified in Additional Protocol 1, Article 51, Part 4. Uh, and when you take a look at it, it tells you that uh, a weapon system, if it is of a nature to strike civilian targets and combatants alike without distinction. So it's unclear whether it's going to attack. Has the, it's, uh, it's unclear whether you're, you're able to aim it or you aren't able to aim it to ensure that it's going after civilians or combatants instead of civilians. Well, then it would become, by, it would be unlawful per se as an indiscriminate uh, by, as an indiscriminate weapon. I would tell you this rule I think is not that major of an impediment for autonomous weapon systems. Um, and in part because there's a little bit of confusion I think uh, often critics talk about this aspect and they and they look and they say oh these weapon systems they wouldn't be able to they wouldn't be able to distinguish between you know if you're looking at the really complex battlefields that that are happening in the world right now uh, say the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan, you know, it's really hard to tell the difference between civilians and combatants there, or you know, uh, lawful combatants. And so, uh, these systems would not be able to make that distinguishing part. But, but unfortunately for, uh, but unfortunately they're kind of missing the boat or the thrust of what this rule is is saying. This rule is saying that the weapon system itself uh, has to be able to be aimed at a military target. And if it's not able to, well, then it would be unlawful. But if it is able to be aimed in certain situations, aimed appropriately in certain situations, then then it would not be in violation of this rule. So let me give you a couple examples I have here. As you can see in the slide. The first uh, shows these balloons from World War II that were used by Japan, hydrogen balloons. Basically, the idea was that they 
uh, Japan set up these balloons uh, filled with hydrogen, and the idea was when they would land, uh, it would cause a, a massive fire. That, that was the, the, the design or the thought. And so they sent these systems up and counted on the wind to blow them across the Pacific Ocean and land somewhere uh, in the U.S. Okay, clearly this sort of system, there was no way for, uh, for the military users to design or to designate or aim it at a particular military target. There was, it would strike a civilian or a military target solely based upon where the wind took it. So that sort of system, okay, that would be uh, indiscriminate by nature and you wouldn't be able to apply it. I don't, I don't think that's where uh, any of the, you know, if you look at the sort of precision systems that are being designed and are in, or thought about in the future for use that may have autonomous features on them, certainly we're not talking about systems like that. So I don't, I don't think that rule applies as much a problem. Now that is different than the indiscriminate use. Okay, and I, the second sample that you see down below there on the slide was um, from the first Gulf War where, uh, where Iraq had sent Scud missiles into, uh, into Israel and trying to attack cities. Okay, and people said, oh, Scud missiles, those are indiscriminate by nature. Well, that's actually not true. And they were certainly used indiscriminately in this sort of case. If you're aiming it towards a city, okay, then you have no, you're, you're not really able to aim it towards, uh, you know, they weren't precise enough for you to, to ensure that it was being aimed towards a military target. It was just being aimed towards the city itself. So it would strike civilians and combatants equal, potentially could it strike them equally. And so that, would, that made them inappropriate to use. But Scud missiles also were, were frankly were designed for attacking out in big desert areas where you had big open tank formations or big large bases. And if you're using in that sort of context, well, then it would have been an appropriate weapon uh, and would not have been indiscriminate in those uses. And so that shows you the difference between a weapon that's indiscriminate by nature and the use of. Okay. A uh, couple things when we're looking at this, a lot of times the, um, you know, I, I think the critics when they when they're talking about that, oh, these are indiscriminate by nature. I think some of it they're missing. It, it's it's counterfactual. Uh, if you take a look at some of the sensors that are being designed for these systems, the um, the ability to analyze and to determine shapes, the size, uh, to intercept communications at the time, and really identify and pinpoint uh, what the target is. Frankly, and even some of the facial recognition software that's being developed, uh, if you know, if you were looking at a personality strike type of a situation where you're going after a particular person, some of those things are really quickly advancing and developing. And so, I, I think some of the concerns about the indiscriminate nature perhaps uh, may be proved to be uh, overblown. I think. Uh, also, I think it's important to make sure when people are talking about these systems that they're not asking an autonomous system to do more than a human-operated system or a human uh, is, is capable of doing. You know, there's a lot of talk uh, from, from critics and others about, oh, these systems, they could so easily be tricked. Uh, they, they, you know, they would be, uh, if you hid your weapon or whatever, they would be confused. Uh, and so therefore, they should be, they're, they're unlawful uh, per se, because you know, they can't determine that. Frankly, uh, for centuries, enemies have been doing things to try and deceive, deceive folks. That doesn't make any of the weapon systems that we're using against uh, enemies today doesn't make them unlawful per se. Uh, certainly nobody's tried to make them be declared unlawful. Uh, okay, along the same lines actually is this notion of the fact that the autonomous systems would be um, would be unable to recognize human intentions, okay, or and, and that they that were human emotions. And so for that reason, the autonomous weapon systems should be made or are uh, unlawful per se. They should be illegal and banned. Uh, now, I'll tell you that very commonplace in the military use now is systems that are able to attack beyond a visual range. Uh, we have lots of examples of systems that have fired from a distance where they're not able to visually see or to identify those emotions. Well, well I certainly think it, it certainly is helpful if you're able to. It doesn't make the weapon system unlawful per se uh, if, if you're not able to see them if you're following some other grounds like, like we've done. And frankly, I would say that when you look at some of the human judgment or pilot error that we've seen in contributing to many, um, many accidental engagements or, or incorrect engagements, uh, you know, I think that having that, that human um, judgment right there doesn't necessarily equate to um, having a, a perfect weapon by any means. Um, okay, and when, further, when it comes with regard to emotions, 
It's also uh, true that atomic weapon systems themselves won't have emotion. And this has been something that's been, that critics have harped on that, oh, now they'll be used by dictators to, uh, to ruthlessly slaughter uh, opponents of, of that dictator. Uh, you know, I, I, it's hard, hard to predict how the systems would use, but I, I would say that the fact that they don't have emotions also cuts the other way. Uh, because we've seen over, uh, over our history many, many, many unfortunate examples of human-conducted atrocities, right, where humans are making the decision and are committing uh, war crimes or other atrocities uh, that you would envision atomic weapon systems won't be because they aren't uh, reacting to based upon revenge or in other, some sort of other self-interest. Uh, or any of those other baser instincts. So, okay, when you take a look at this part of the rule, so we're looking at this part of weapons law, I think that uh, autonomous weapon systems would only violate this prohibition if there are no circumstances, I think it's clear that they would not violate this rule if there are no circumstances given its intended use in which it can be used discriminately. And, and I don't envision that that's going to be an issue with the way these systems are designed. So let's take a look at the second aspect of weapons law, and that is the rule that weapon systems cannot cause unnecessary suffering or superfluous injury. This rule uh, is also customary, and it, but it was, it's been codified in Additional Protocol 1. Uh, when you take a look at it, this rule is trying to prevent weapon systems that are uh, weapon systems that themselves cause this sort of uh, inhuman uh, injuries or, or aggravation to injuries. Uh, classic examples of this are bomblets that uh, aren't detectable on x-rays, for instance. So like a glass bomb or something where when it, if you, somebody was struck by it and they were taken to a medical facility and you try to do an x-ray to see how to treat them, you would not be able to because it's been specifically designed uh, to prevent that. Uh, and so to not have these sort of needless or inhumane injuries, uh, the law of armed conflict has forbidden these sort of weapon systems. So, yes, it is possible that somebody would put a glass bomblet, for instance, uh, on board a autonomous weapon system. But the mere possibility of this happening, and, and I think it's clearly, I think that's unlikely, uh, the mere possibility would not make the weapon system itself illegal per se. Uh, because what you're focusing on, uh, you know, what this rule is focusing on is the weapon system's effect on the targeted individual, and it's not focusing on the manner of the engagement, which is the autonomous feature. So I don't think autonomous features, autonomous weapons in any, uh, sh in any measure would trigger uh, concern under this prohibition. Okay, so those are the two things that you look at for whether a weapon system is unlawful per se. Uh, and there's ways that nations are tasked with making sure that they are not developing weapons that are unlawful per se. So weapons that are not indiscriminate by, na by the very nature and weapons that are not causing unnecessary suffering. How do they do that? You do that through a weapons review process. Uh, and states um, would be expected, if you have an autonomous weapon system if, or if a nation is considering developing an autonomous weapon system, they would be expected to comply with this rule. It's uh, codified in their, also in additional protocol one under article 36. Uh, there is some controversy about whether all aspects of the rule are customary international law, and there's some disagreements from among nations, including the U.S., about exactly what the rule requires. Whether, if you look at the language of the rule, it requires reviews for both the means of warfare and the methods of warfare, so the, the weapon systems themselves and then the, the, the tactics. Um, and so there's a little bit of disagreement, but certainly I think it's fairly well, there's consensus that any new weapon system itself, the development of a weapon system like an autonomous weapon system, uh, is required to have this legal review. Uh, and so uh, you would expect uh, that all nations would have to do a review where they look at making sure that the weapon complies generally with the law of armed conflict, that it specifically complies with the two rules we just talked about from weapons law before it, one, develops the system, uh, and then uh, and then certainly before its use. Now again, there's a little bit of disagreement about whether the U.S. has agreed to doing those two different reviews. I'll tell you by policy, uh, if you look at the, the new DOD policy, 3000.09, uh, according to that policy, the U.S. seemingly has agreed to doing 
There's two separate reviews in that particular case dealing with any sort of weapon systems. Uh, member states to additional protocol one would certainly have to do both reviews as well. Uh, and then you'd have to do reviews if you modified the system and there's some other there's some other things that you'd have to take a look at. But certainly so you'd have those reviews. Now I will tell you, given the fact that the you know that these are such um, you know the prospect of these weapon systems it's very new. Uh, I, I think that this legal requirement it does loom large and it is something that would need to be uh, carefully managed and, and processed by countries wanting to do it. I also think given the fact that the technology technology that's embedded in these systems or the advances that's likely to be embedded in these systems, uh, it makes what you could say, oh, it's a straightforward task, that's pretty easy. I think it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, certainly the lawyers who are conducting these sort of evaluations and these examinations, they would have to work extremely closely with the uh, computer scientists, the engineers, the others to make sure it really understood what the measures of reliability were, what the testing methods were, how it was validated. Um, so I think those things would be significant. But I think that we are also dealing with that with a variety of other complex, complicated uh, contemporary weapon systems that, that we're developing. And so I, I don't think it's necessarily a, um, a hurdle that's too hard, too hard to reach. Okay. Nor do I think that it, you know, nor do I think that it would cause an impediment uh, overall, uh, a bigger impediment for uh, the use of autonomous weapon systems than it would for other weapon systems. Okay, so if the weapon system itself is not unlawful per se, so the w we next have to look at how would we actually use the weapon system that we now are looking to deploy onto the battlefield. Okay, so when you're looking there, you look at targeting law. Okay, the second aspect of law. And, and remember, a weapon system has to be able to navigate both of these tracks, both aspects, successfully before you can actually use it on the battlefield. So if we've met the first hurdle, now we look at the second one. Targeting law. Three main core requirements exist for targeting law. Those are the principles of distinction, proportionality, and ensuring that all feasible precautions and attack have been met or have been taken. Okay, so let's examine each of those a little more closely and make sure that everyone's comfortable with what the rules actually apply. Uh, and I will tell you that these use issues, I think, are going to be certainly a bigger concern than, than, than the weapons law discussion we just had. Uh, I, I don't think that the weapons law prohibitions are going to cause uh, as much problems for uh, uh, autonomous weapon systems to be developed, but I, d I do think the use laws do raise some, some unique challenges, and so it's important to look at those a little more closely. And I'll tell you, if you look at other groups like the International Committee for the Red Cross, one of the things they have stated is that the debates over um, the legal and other implications of the use of the autonomous weapon systems are in particular the uh, where the focus of the debate should be versus debating uh, whether they're unlawful per se. They really think that it's, it's more of a focus on the use, and, and I would tend to agree with that position. Okay, when you take a look at distinction, that is a cardinal principle of the law of armed conflict. It is one of the foundational rules. It's been recognized by the International Court of Justice as such. It's codified in additional protocol one of, of um, AP uh, uh, of Article 48 of Additional Protocol 1, and it states that parties to the conflict shall at all times distinguish between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian objects and military objectives, and that they only direct their actions, their operations against military op objectives. Okay, I think it's a very customary principle, uh, and it would absolutely apply for autonomous weapon systems. So autonomous weapon systems that were cons being considered to use on the battlefield would have to comply with this principle of distinction. Now, uh, when you take a look at the systems, uh, I think it's clear. You certainly can't use an autonomous weapon system to go directly attack a civilian or terrorize the civilian population. I think that would be pretty, pretty uh, understandable and uh, agreed upon uh, principle. But how would they be able to, be com to comply uh, in general? Well, you'd have to have the appropriate sort of sensors uh, or suite of sensors and um, other recognition abilities so that the system was able to distinguish appropriately between civilians and combatants in that particular area. Uh, a lot of it is based upon the context. Where is the system envisioned? Where are you envisioning using the system? Are you envisioning using the system out in the desert against uh, armed uh, tank formations, enemy tank formations? 
are, are you envisioned using the system somewhere like the demilitarized zone where you have uh, very few civilians uh, that may be appearing in between you and the enemy? Are you using it, say, underwater where there's far fewer civilian um, craft where, where really you're dealing with enemy submarines only? Uh, those sort of things would certainly apply about how robust a series of sensors and um, recognition packages that the system would need to have. But you, it, it's pretty generally clear to say that the system uh, would only be unlawful if the sensor ability wasn't sufficient, for, wasn't sufficient to distinguish for that particular expected environment or that battlefield that it's placing in. So that, that's kind of more of a fact. It would be highly dependent on the circumstances. Uh, but that's something that producers of autonomous weapon systems would have to make sure that they are considering and ensuring that they're complying with if they intend to, if a nation intends to use that system on the battlefield. Okay, the second one, the second principle we're going to look at is proportionality. And this one is a little more complex. Frankly, it's a little more complex for all weapon systems, but certainly uh, it is uniquely so for autonomous weapon systems. This principle, uh, also customary principle, also a fundamental principle of the law of all conflict, is one where there's an analysis uh, uh, between collateral damage and the expected or anticipated military gain or the military advantage that is uh, that the side anticipates receiving from that attack. So it takes a look when they're planning a particular attack, the force under this rule is required to analyze, determine how, how many civilians may be injured or civilian property might be injured, okay, and then look at well, how important is it to actually conduct this strike? Then looking at the two of them, the force has to determine that, in fact, the collateral damage, so the harm to the civilians, the incidental harm to civilians that is expected, has to ensure that it is not excessive in relation to, uh, to how important or what the gain is to be anticipated from that attack. So you're kind of looking at the, between those two issues. Now, so how would an autonomous system be able to do that analysis? Or would it be able to, I guess, is the question. OK, the first part, let's look at the collateral damage. How hard is it for an autonomous system to determine how many civilians might be injured from a particular attack? I would propose to you that I think that that is something that an autonomous system ultimately, you know, again, if, assuming technology moves along, I think that it would be fairly easy for an autonomous system to reach that calculation. And it's in part because the system that the military uses now uh, the collateral damage estimation methodology. It is a methodology based upon science. Uh, it's based on objective and scientific data uh, and algorithms, and it's based on things like predicting uh, the number of civilians that are in particular areas. It's also based upon knowing things about the building composition, you know, whatever the target building is, knowing things about the composition, knowing things about the precision of the weapon uh, and its blast effect or, or the amount of the, the radius uh, of an area that could be damaged from that particular blast. All those sort of scientific facts go in and produce, ultimately, some sort of determination of how, how many um, civilians, how many people could be uh, killed in that particular strike. Um, given its scientific nature, I think that's something that you could program into an autonomous system to tell you with uh, a, a fairly high degree of reliability. But the other aspect, I said we're, we're analyzing two things together. Uh, the second thing that you're looking at is the military advantage. So you're looking at how important is this particular strike to your force. OK, and determining that is, uh, I think, a little more complex or much more complex than, than determining uh, how the expected number of civilians that may be injured or, or killed in a strike. So how do you determine how important a strike is? Well, clearly, that is dependent a lot on the context. Right? Any strike that you're going to do, uh, no, no two strikes are, are the same. Right? So each one is a case-by-case -case analysis. You have to determine how important it is to you. And it, it's based upon a variety of factors. I mean, some of the things that you take a look at when you're analyzing proportionality or you're analyzing the military gain, uh, let's say you're attacking a tank. OK, a tank is worth, you know, hey, OK, we, that, that's a fairly valuable target. If we can destroy that tank, that's going to help our particular side. OK, I think that's a fair assessment. But how about the fact that if a tank is by itself, uh, is it worth the same as a tank that's part of a, a column or, or a formation of tanks? Okay, or is, is each of those individual, if you took one out of the formation and, and one by itself, are they worth the same? Probably not. Probably the one in the formation, because that has greater uh, ability to cause harm, that one's probably a little more valuable than the one that's by itself. How about if the vehicles, if you have a, a tank, the tanks, 
uh, are moving towards you, towards your, your base or your headquarters or whatever, versus they're pulling back and heading back to the rear. Well, clearly the ones that are coming at you, I think, would be more important and would have a higher value, an anticipated military gain would be higher in that context than the one that's leaving. So those are the sort of things that, that matter for this analysis. And how could an autonomous weapon system be expected to make that uh, calculation and those determinations and make that judgment? Now, I think it's unlikely, uh, at least in the immediate future, without some significant advances in artificial intelligence, I think it's significantly, or it's, it's unlikely that you're going to have systems able to make that judgment call on their own. But I, I don't think that that is necessarily the uh, end all be all of this uh, analysis and the decision, oh, well, clearly uh, they'll never be able to, uh, we autonomous weapon systems will never be able to comply with the principle of proportionality, therefore uh, we, should, we, we, we never should be developing them. Uh, I think if you're taking a look at how the systems are going to be used and how the human operator involvement will be with these systems, I think that there are ways, potentially, uh, that the systems could comply with these rules um, by using some sort of having the humans inject themselves into the process and provide some sort of sliding scale uh, type algorithm that, that kind of gives value to uh, particular targets. Um, and so you basically have the commander telling the system, embedding into the programming of the system uh, for the particular mission, a value uh, associated with a variety of targets in the area. Uh, now, if you're going to do that, so basically the human is, is telling the system, here are the thresholds. Okay, here's the minimums uh, of what something is worth. So the tank is always worth X collateral damage in this particular mission for this particular stage of the battle. The commander could embed that sort of information into the system. Uh, now, so clearly the human has to make that determination in advance. Uh, I, would su subject, I would suppose that if you have that sort of arrangement, the commander is going to give pretty conservative values for those. Okay, the commander is going to set the thresholds at a point so that it's nowhere near where, uh, where someone objectively looking at this scenario could say, wow, that's excessive or not. I, I, I think you're, ending up, you're going to end up with autonomous systems having very low thresholds to, re to act without uh, further guidance, perhaps. But I, but I do think it is a mechanism. Uh, and a lot will depend on you know, how maybe these algorithms could be developed in the future. But I, but I do think that it is a possibility of a way that the systems will be able to be deployed on the battlefield and still comply with the principles of proportionality, uh, that they will be able to do that by nature of having the human involvement uh, in the process. And that's why I, I've said all along, I, I really don't think there's such a situation as a human out of the loop. Uh, I think you're always going to have human commanders, operators involved in these sort of decisions. Okay, uh, I also think that it's important for when you're taking a look at this proportionality analysis, because one of the things critics you know, would contend is that, wow, they're not able, you, know, you, you can't possibly have a commander anticipate every imaginable thing that could show up on the battlefield and, and, and have a value associated with all of those things. Uh, and so, oh my goodness, the, the, the system is, is flawed in that regard. But I tell you that the same, frankly, is true of human, humans who are confronted with the unexpected things on the battlefield or confusing events, and they're forced to make it that time-sensitive decision to combat. Okay, I think neither the human nor the autonomous system is held, should be held to a standard of perfection. Okay, in the law of armed conflict, the standard is always one of reasonableness. Reasonableness. And so I do think that we can, uh, that systems will be able to be developed to, to meet that threshold. Um, okay, so I do think in the end, um, the humans will ultimately still be making the proportionality calls, uh, the required proportionality calls for the foreseeable future through that pre-programming that they do in the embedding into the system to ensure that ex the collateral damage that may occur from an autonomous weapon strike would not be excessive. But I, I do think that is, uh, that, that could, is a, a potential possibility pending uh, how the technology develops. Okay, and then the last aspect of the targeting law that we want, I wanted to take a look at in particular is the, feasible, the notion of feasible precautions in attack. Okay, again, another central component of the law of, of armed conflict, a uh, customary principle that's uh, codified in Article 57 of the Additional Protocol, uh, provide, puts si significant or puts obligations on uh, forces when they're conducting attacks or planning to conduct attacks. And I think absolutely these obligations 
do and would apply to autonomous weapon systems. So you'd still have these same requirements applying for autonomous weapon systems that are used in the battlefield. So what does that mean? That means that autonomous weapon systems will have to do everything feasible uh, in this context to ensure, um, to ensure that it's meeting those obligations. Uh, and a force who wants to use one would have, would have to uh, make sure that this weapon system has the suspension sensors to make sure that it's doing the things needed. Uh, if you take a look at some of the aspects of what precautions are, are needed to take under that rule, uh, they, uh, the, the rule implies that you're doing everything you can to minimize civilian casualties. Okay, in fact, you're, um, you're so that's why you need to make sure that the system has sufficient sensors to do that. Uh, and you have to make sure that the weapon system is, in fact, complying with those principles of proportionality that, that we've just discussed. So clearly, as we discussed, you'd want to make sure that the systems are embedded with those sort of thresholds so that it, know how to it knew how to respond and what was appropriate to respond. Uh, and then th there are some other aspects or obligations under this rule that I think are, are really key to this controversy. And one is the uh, obligation under the feasible precautions and attack provision to select the means of warfare likely to cause the least harm to civilians and civilian objects without sacrificing military advantage. So let's consider the practical no the practicalities of that norm, you know, the implications of what that norm says. It basically says that if you have a manned system or remotely piloted system that is better at reducing collateral damage, uh, then you should, whenever it's practical or feasible, you should be using that system. You should be employing it versus, say, an autonomous system. Okay, so if the manned system is better at minimizing casualties, then that's the system that should be used. So the law already has a provision. That, that's why what, when the critics uh, are concerned about it, you can point to this provision of the law and say that there are, uh, that, that the law already envisions ensuring that forces are doing everything they can to minimize civilian casualties. And so the, the notion that, oh, they will blindly use autonomous weapon systems uh, would be in uh, direct uh, contradiction with what the, what the rule is. So if you're following the law, then you're only using the weapon system. In essence, you'd only be using autonomous weapon systems in situations that they can lawfully be employed okay, and when its use would realize the same military objectives uh, that can't be obtained by any other readily available systems. So that would cause less collateral damage. So that only when they w essentially would be the best available systems could they be used. And so I think that goes a long way into undercutting some of the uh, concerns that critics may have um, on uh, the dangers of using autonomous weapon systems because the law is implying that they would only be used when better systems are not feasible or practical to be used. Uh, or when, in fact, they are, in fact, the most precise and the best systems to be deployed on the battlefield for that particular environment. Uh, now, there's certainly some flexibilities there in what the rules require, um, but you know, I, I think it does sh prove the point or uh, demonstrate the point that the law of armed conflict does provide some solid protections when it comes to autonomous weapon systems, and that may explain why a ban would be unnecessary as a matter of law. Okay, one other thing to consider in this vein uh, is if you think carefully about what this rule is actually saying, too, and what it implies, and the consequence, you know, if you contemplate what the consequence would be of banning these systems. Okay, the rule says forces should do everything that they can to try to minimize collateral damage. They should select the means of warfare that are likely to cause the smallest amount of collateral damage. Okay, well, what if the autonomous weapon system in a particular situation under whatever circumstances, either because their sensor package is, is, is so robust or its decision-making capability is, uh, is better in that rapidly changing environment, what if that autonomous weapon system were, in fact, better able to minimize civilian casualties than a manned system or a remotely piloted system? Okay, well, now the law would require you to use that system. And so the, by, by banning them, we, we'd, we'd be undercutting the thrust of or, or the impetus, kind of the object and purpose of, of this provision of law, uh, where the idea is we want to minimize civilian casualties. Now, obviously, you know, I, I can't guarantee where the research is going to go. There's no guarantees that Thomas Weapon System will ever get to the point when they will be more capable uh, or be in a better position to minimize civilian casualties than any manned or, or, or remotely controlled systems. But certainly it's possible, and that's why one of the problems uh, that why it may be a concern if you're looking 
for the critics who are looking for a complete ban on these systems is that uh, we may be taking ourselves, put, taking something out, out of the arsenal that may ultimately uh, be more in compliance with the law and, and would be able to uh, provide better protections for civilians in certain circumstances. Okay, I want to look at two other aspects of the law uh, that I think autonomous weapon systems raise some unique issues or concerns. Okay, the first is subjectivity. Okay, subjectivity plays a big role in the law of armed conflict. You take a look at where, uh, basically with subjectivity, we're talking about human judgment. Okay, the idea that a human is ultimately having to weigh and balance these things and, and reaching their subjective decision about what the appropriate course of conduct is. So, I, I would point to you that it, it plays a part in a lot of the rules of the law of armed conflict, many of the ones that we've just discussed here today. If you take a look at proportionality, for instance, uh, the rule generally is, in, is expecting that s subjective decision about whether uh, an attack would, be ca would cause an excessive amount of collateral damage. What is excessive? Well, that's a subjective decision about what's excessive. There's, there's not a particular rule that this number of civilian deaths, too many, is excessive. There's, there's no set correlation uh, that, that tells you that. So you're looking at subjectively making that sort of decision. Uh, and many critics have, have argued, well, look, autonomous weapon systems, they're not able to make this subjective decision. Therefore, they can't comply with the law of armed conflict uh, and, and as, as one sort of um, just further justification for their proposal to ban the systems. Well, I would respectfully disagree with that position. Um, now, I certainly think it is doubtful uh, that autonomous weapon systems will be able to make these subjective decisions in the near future. Uh, even if you have the most optimistic notions or, or dreams of how, uh, how artificial intelligence may improve in the coming years, uh, I think it's unlikely that they're going to be able to make those decisions for themselves. So if the systems can't make that decision, who, you know, then how are we still complying with these subjective requirements that are uh, existing throughout the law of armed conflict? And I think, once again, you look to the human operator involvement or the human commander involvement in the process. I, I think the critics are failing, they're a little misguided because they're failing to fully appreciate how the autonomous weapon system targeting process would actually occur. Okay, to comply with this law, humans are going to need to inject themselves throughout uh, at periodic points along the process to ensure compliance with these sort of subjective decisions. And I think though that, this, that these judgment calls can be made by humans uh, throughout the process. Some of them may be made before you even decide to launch the system. The commander may decide, taking a look at the particular battlefield, the particular target, the environment, that the autonomous weapon system uh, would be able to comply in this circumstance. He would uh, set his appropriate thresholds, and he would subjectively uh, make the determinations in advance that this is an appropriate, decision, appropriate weapon system to be used for that mission. So they would be they could be launched in that particular thing, uh, into that particular environment, and I think justifiably have complied or reasonably complied with the provision uh, to provide to have the to have made the necessary subjective decisions uh, in anticipation of this strike. So I think that ultimately what you're looking at is you're having a human operator who is making those subjective calculations in advance uh, and providing them to the autonomous weapon system in forms of in the form of guidance. So the guidance that's being embedded in the software into the system, then the autonomous weapon system is actually just being tasked with making some sort of objective calculations uh, about how to perform on the battlefield. So they are looking at objective calculations. As long as I'm under these sort of thresholds, then I am in compliance, then I will engage. If I'm outside of those thresholds, then the autonomous weapon system would not engage. Uh, and I think if you have that new analysis, I mean, it's certainly a new uh, it, you know, it represents a new way of looking at the LOAC subjectivity requirements, uh, and, and certainly, uh, you know, they'll, they, these, the, this new way of looking at it may be controversial, but, but I do think it's one way that the use of autonomous web systems could be done lawfully and in compliance with these provisions. Okay, the next, the second area I wanted to look at was responsibility. Okay, the idea of who is accountable, who should be held accountable, what sort of accountability do we have for the use of autonomous weapon systems. I think that the systems, if you look at autonomy, it, it does represent a greater separation 
of the human from the battlefield. Uh, and so I think there are some significant questions that arise when you look at how are you going to uh, hold somebody accountable for battlefield conduct. Now, the opponents would, you know, the critics for the systems would say, hey, if you've removed humans from these final targeting decisions, uh, that now we've prevented the proper assignment of legal responsibility. We can't hold anybody accountable, and, and that's one of the justifications for banning the systems. Uh, I, I think that contrary to the critics' concerns, I think that humans can be held uh, legally responsible for the actions of autonomous weapon systems, uh, even when they're not controlling every single move. So certainly a drone pilot uh, with you know a remotely piloted predator drone, yeah, you can understand how that person is. But I think even with a, the separation of an autonomous system, we have a controller giving the parameters and the provisions to the system, I think that you can have similar accountability for that person. But I, I, I do concede that it does raise some, some unique concerns. I mean, some of the issues, I think, are pretty straightforward. Clearly, if you have an individual uh, commander, whoever, who intentionally programs the autonomous weapon system to go and engage in an action that could amount to a war crime, well, I think that's pretty clear that that person could be held liable. I think that's pretty simple. Uh, likewise, if you use the system in an unlawful manner, so let's say you had an autonomous weapon system that, hey, was not that good at distinguishing civilian people from combatants. Okay, that may be okay to use on an area where you're, having, where you're worried about tanks in formation, but it certainly wouldn't be a good system to use uh, in an urban environment of a conflict. Okay, so if they used it in the urban environment, well, that, that would be an unlawful use of the system. I think you could hold that commander accountable. So I think some of those are straightforward, but other accountability issues, uh, they would be more complex. And uh, if you take a look, um, you know, the critics would say, hey, some of these systems are going to be so complicated that it may be hard for a commander to really understand uh, how the system would respond to certain things. And so, you know, as I've mentioned several times today, oh, the human operator is going to embed their guidance into it. Yeah, it is possible that the systems could be too complex. Uh, they would be so complex that it, it would be perhaps difficult to hold a commander responsible for the system's actions. Um, and, and, and perhaps there could be an accountability gap in those, those few instances. Uh, it, it's unclear. Obviously, a lot will depend on what the technology holds and how it's developed in the future. But I do think uh, it's something that would represent a little bit of a hurdle and something that nations would want to think about as they move forward and continue uh, pondering whether they want to develop any autonomous weapon systems in the future. OK, that brings us to the conclusion. Uh, I think there's a few points that I wanted to emphasize one last time. And that is that I think that humans are always going to be in the loop uh, when it comes to autonomous weapon systems. I think all the envisionment of having autonomous systems on the battlefield imply that commanders will continue to retain the appropriate amount of oversight uh, in their use. Uh, and I think as a result that they will be able to be held accountable uh, in, in all but a few, perhaps, instances as we just described. Uh, I also think that autonomous weapon systems are not unlawful per se. Okay, as a matter of law, I think that they are not uh, the prohibitions. They would be able to navigate successfully and under most circumstances. Uh, well, not, not under most circumstances, but I think cer in certain circumstances, they'd be able to navigate uh, certainly through the weapons law issues. Uh, I don't think that they are indiscriminate by their nature, and I don't think they would cause unnecessary suffering. Uh, and I think also through the targeting law aspects, okay, the, proportion, the distinction of proportionality and feasible precautions in attack. They would be able to comply with those rules under certain circumstances. Now, there may be uh, complex battlefields, urban environments, where perhaps they would be inappropriate for use. But the law already has provisions. Those provisions that we just talked about with the targeting law has those provisions would pr which would prevent their use in those circumstances. But I think in other situations, uh, they would certainly be lawful uh, and, and could be used. Uh, and so overall, I, I think that in general, a ban of autonomous weapon systems at this point is premature. Uh, there ha we haven't had any systems fielded, developed. Um, and so it's too early for uh, that sort of judgment call to be made about where the systems may go, uh, what, what sort of promise they may deliver in the end. And in particular, as, I, as we discussed with the feasible precautions and attack, you may end up taking a system that could potentially, in certain circumstances, minimize civilian casualties better than other systems, and you're, you're removing, it from an op removing it from being an option already in advance. So I think that, as a matter of law, 
uh, such a band is not supportable uh, or not required. Okay, that concludes today's lecture. Uh, I really want to thank you for your interest in this very uh, uh, emerging debate and uh, unique um, the unique aspects of autonomous weapon systems, this, this topic. Uh, for more information, if you are interested in reading more about the autonomous weapon systems, uh, if you're interested in learning more about the law of armed conflict, I'd encourage you to come to our department website, which is www.usnwc.edu, that's for U.S. Naval War College, .edu slash ILD for the International Law Department. Uh, and, and you'll be able to see more of our research and our efforts into this particular, um, into this, this particular emerging topic um, at your leisure there. So thank you so much. Have a great day.